I don't usually make little films. <clears throat> I'm a writer, so I put words on the page. But this week, I've been feeling pretty rotten. I was in bed all last weekend with a virus, and I haven't shaken it off. And I haven't been able to write much. Um, so I'm going to do this because I just wanted to say a few things about what's going to happen here at the Abbey of Misrule over the next few months or longer, maybe, we'll see. And I don't have the energy to write it down. Uh, and anyway, it makes a change. And also I have something I wanted to show you. Um, because this is, uh, this is one of the interesting things that happens to you as a writer. Um, it's a strange thing being a writer in a way because you stick your words down on the page, um, digital or actual, physical, and you send it out there into the world. And unless people write to you or tell you what they think about you, you've no idea what impact the words have. I mean, you might get some reviews, good or bad, um, but really you want to hear from the readers, and so you don't know. Uh, and sometimes I get emails and people tell me nice things or not so nice things about what I do, and that's fine. Um, but sometimes one of the perks of being a writer is someone will write to you and they'll say, I'd really like to send you a gift. And uh, that's happened to me a few times, especially since I started this series. It's a really nice thing. And people have sent me books. Uh, and sometimes people have even made me things, which is really lovely. Um, the other day I got an email from uh, one of my readers. Yaroslav might be watching this. Um, we've actually met briefly. And he said to me, I want to send you something I made for you. Could you give me your address? So I did that. Now, Yaroslav is a computer programmer who's recently taken up blacksmithing, which is the right way around. Um, and then, a few days ago, I received this uh, this tube in the post. Here's the tube. And here is, I don't know if you can see this, here's the address that was printed on the tube. Look at that. Four Kings North, famous writer, <laughs> County Galway. That got here, so I was impressed with that. And the, the postmen around here know what they're doing. Um, so I open up the tube and, and out comes this little item. It's not a little item, it's enormous, and it's heavy. A uh, beautiful piece of smith work. Look at this. I don't know if you, how well you can see that in my amateur videoing. So anyway, what this is, I didn't know. Looks like a poker, doesn't it? Or it's got a little hook at the end. I thought maybe it's for hanging things over the fire. Anyway, I looked at this a bit more closely. I don't know if you can see this, but I noticed that Yaroslav had actually printed or carved something onto the piece of work that he's made. Look at this, can you read it? The, the Abbey of Misrule. How about that? How about that? It's a, it's a branded fire iron. That's quite something. And as I say, I thought it was probably for hanging pots on, but uh, there was a little bit of paper in with it, which tells me this thing is for making hot toddies. If you don't know what a hot toddy is, it's hot whiskey and lemon. And I've been having a few of those over the last few days, and this has helped. Apparently, you heat this in the fire till it's red hot, and then you dip it into your hot toddy and warm it up. And what I didn't know about hot toddies, according to this little bit of paper that Yaroslav sent me with this, is the drink was supposedly invented in Edinburgh, and it's named after a holy well, Tobar Todd. It's called a hot toddy. So originally, the water in a hot toddy comes from a holy well, which seemed appropriate. So. Not always easy being a writer, not that I'm whining about it, but uh, you get some really wonderful perks. There's one of them. Thank you. Thank you, Yaroslav. Um, I just think this is a testament to the quality of my readership. Um, now, speaking of my readership, this week I noticed I've got over 50,000 subscribers to the Abbey of Misrule. Obviously, most of them free subscribers, or I'd be living on an island next to Elon Musk. Um, but that's really quite exciting. I like that. I'm very happy about that. Thank you, all of you. Um, makes a difference. I know writers say stuff like this, but, you know, this is my living, and the stuff I've managed to do over the last couple of years on here has uh, only been possible because people have subscribed. And the result of that, at the moment, is I'm trying to turn my Essays on the Machine into a book. I've written about this before. Some of you might know about it. Penguin is going to publish it next year in the United States, and hopefully there'll be some publishers elsewhere as well. Um, now that's the reason that I haven't written as much on the Abbey at the moment in the last month or so as I have been doing in the past. I am aware of that. Um, so 
thank you for your patience. It's going to be another month or so before I get this thing finished. Turns out that uh, turning my online essays into a book is a bit harder than I thought it was. A lot more work involved. I've never done a book like this before. Not in this way. So it's quite a challenge. Um, so I'm up to that. And when I've done that, I'm going to have more to say on here. Now, I've thought a lot about what to do in the future. Um, there's a danger when you write something like this because I've got money coming in from this. And so, given that I have to feed my children and it's nice to have a living wage for something you actually want to do, obviously the temptation is to keep doing it. And you have to be really careful as a writer. If you ever find yourself just writing for money, you've got to stop what you're doing and run away. Unless you work in advertising, uh, which I don't. Um, but I'm not doing that. I've thought a lot about I thought a lot about what to do. And as I said a while back, um, me becoming a Christian, um, which was a surprise to me, probably more than anyone else, um, has meant that it's very difficult for me to write about anything that doesn't that doesn't focus around that, because if that becomes the centre of your life, you can't just put it to one side. It's not just something that happens on a Sunday morning. But um, on the other hand, I'm not sure I'm a Christian writer, whatever that is. Um, I remember reading something, actually. I remember reading a blog by another Christian writer a while back, whose name I can't remember. And he said when he became a Christian, he prayed to God. He said, thank you, Lord, for making me a Christian, but please don't make me a Christian writer. <laughs> I think there's a difference between a writer who's a Christian and a Christian writer. Anyway, so uh, this is, I suppose, a long way of, of talking about what I want to do next, whatever it is. I was watching uh, a little video on YouTube the other day um, by Father Seraphim Aldea of the Orthodox Monastery on Mull up in Scotland, which is um, it's a sister monastery of the monastery that I visit and worship at here in Ireland, the Monastery of the Life-Giving Spring. And uh, Father Seraphim is great. If you haven't watched his films, uh, his little homilies um, online, it's well worth doing. There's a lot of wisdom in there. And I was watching one the other day. Sometimes they pop up when I go onto YouTube. They pop up in my little algorithmic feed and uh, just at the right time. So um, I don't know if that's demonic persuasion or just useful coincidence, but whatever it is, I watched it. Um, and it was a video about how as soon as you become a Christian, your life gets harder. It's worth watching it. It was very good. Um, and Father Seraphim said, look, when, when you, I'm going to paraphrase him here probably badly, so go and watch the film. Maybe I'll put a link in or something here. He was basically saying that the process of becoming a Christian takes you out of the world. Of course it does, because you're walking towards Christ, you're walking towards God, and that requires you to walk away from the world. You may find that the thing you did in the world, even if you got really good at it, you might be less good at or you might not want to do it, or you might not be able to do it so much. He talks about um, St. Siloan, the Athenite, great modern saint on Mount Athos, who, who said this explicitly. He's, he's heard, he'd heard from a lot of people that the expertise that they had in the world almost drained away, or was rechanneled, or became something else, because you're walking towards Christ, and the way of the world and the way of God are not the same thing. And it's something that I've really felt has been happening to me, as a writer, and I'm not quite sure what it is exactly that's happening, or how to deal with it. And I've written about this a little bit here, talked about it a lot as well. And I think about this in terms of the wild saints I've been writing about here as well, because once you start to read the hagiography of the, of the saints, um, you find a pattern, it's a very interesting pattern. It's a kind of threefold pattern, it's almost mythological. Um, you know, the saints I'm interested in writing about, there are a lot of different kinds of saints, but the people I'm writing about are the people who appeal to my instinct for running away and hiding in remote caves. <laughs> I was writing about that long before I was a Christian. I wrote a whole novel about a man who did that. Um, and these saints, they, uh, they leave the world. And they often leave the world, interestingly, for this symbolic period of seven years. And off they go. They go into the woods, they go into the desert, they go into the caves. And they strip everything away. Uh, and they're looking for God. They're looking to follow Christ. They're looking to fight the devil. They're looking to achieve theosis, which uh, to an Orthodox Christian is the purpose of a human life. Theosis being a union with God. Which is another way of saying that you are trying to return from your exile and go home. Now these saints, 
very often um, they leave the world, they are transformed, but then the world wants them back again. And this is um, it's a really common pattern, as I say. I wrote about this with St. Cuthbert of Lindisfarne, wonderful English saint, very famous saint. Cuthbert is the abbot of the monastery, but he needs to go and he goes to Innerfarne and he lives on this little island, Innerfarne, for uh, seven years, I believe. And he's, he's there praying in the sea and the, he's surrounded by the ducks and the otters. He doesn't want to go anywhere. But then along comes the king and along comes the bishop and along come all the monks from the mainland and they all ask him to come home and serve and to become the bishop. But he's desperate not to go. He's shedding tears. But he becomes convinced in the end that this is what God wants him to do and so he returns to the world. But he goes back to Winnefarne to die. Very similar picture with St. Coleman Makduak in Ireland, who's my favourite saint over here, whose cave I've slept in. Very similar pattern. And you see this pattern all over the world. You go out, you walk away from the world, you are transformed and you come back. I just want to be clear at this point that I'm not comparing myself to a saint. I'm sort of rambling through these stories, I think, for a reason. Um, now, interestingly, there are examples, actually, of, of, of monks, uh, holy people who refuse this call. Um, there was, a, there was a, a monk called John the Fingerless from Romania that I read about quite a while back. And John the Fingerless had got out into the, into the forests of Romania as a wild saint or attempting to be a wild saint. And they'd come to him and they'd said, we'd like you to come back and become a priest. He was desperate not to be a priest. The last thing he wanted was to get involved in the church's bureaucracy. But they kept saying, this is, we need a holy man, please come and become a priest. John was so desperate not to become a priest that he cut off the two fingers of his hand so that he couldn't make a blessing and couldn't become a priest. So that's an extreme example of what the mythologist Joseph Campbell called the refusal of the call. The refusal of the call. So anyway, look, there's a pattern. Um, and I think the point is that when you become a Christian, whether you like it or not, you're going to be drawn out of the world. Um, and I, I, I feel like that's happened to me. Uh, as I say, I'll just reiterate that I'm not comparing myself to a saint, but I think the pattern's true of all of us. Um, we have to be transformed into something else, so we get taken out of the place. Uh, and to me, I think that's manifested in my in my writing. That was the thing I was good at. That was the thing I did. When I was younger, I wanted to be a famous novelist and win all the prizes and all that. Can't think of anything worse these days, but there it is. Um, so... I've just been writing about saints and I've just been writing about wells and I haven't had any desire to write the kind of analytical pieces that I was writing before when I was doing my series on the machine and yet I wonder now what to do about this. How can these things be fused? How would you how would you answer the call to come back to the world if you were a writer who'd been drawn out of it? Because I can't write about the world in the way that I used to. And yet we're living in this time which it's difficult to say whether a time you're living in is unique because we all think the times we're living in are unique and we all think we're unique as well. Um, but there's something really special and strange and frightening about this time. We are living in the age of the machine. And the age of the machine is very specifically an age of atheism. There are not many societies in history that I've ever come across that have denied the existence of God at all. They may have had a million different ways of worshipping, a million different ways of understanding what the divinity is and what the light beyond this world is. But they never deny it exists, and we do. We do. Our culture says there's nothing. There's nothing except what we can measure with our instruments. And that is going to drive us mad. And I think if you want to look at the culture war in that, in that context, look at the collapse of our, our societies going on right in front of our faces, I think in that context, the depression and the psychosis, the drug use, all of the stuff that's happening, especially amongst the young, the sense of meaningless, especially amongst younger generations. That's what it comes down to. It is a God-shaped hole. Um, and I don't think you have to be a Christian to see that. I don't think so. Um, humans all the time throughout the whole of human history have had a religious drive. Why is that? I'm not going to be convinced by a kind of rationalist, atheist answer that it's just some kind of superstition that people had within them just so they could explain how the thunder and the rain happened. I don't think so. 
we've got some sort of intrinsic desire to go back home again. Something in us wants God, even if he doesn't know how to find God, and I didn't know how to find God most of my life. And I'm still not sure I do. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm on the right path, but I'm not always sure I'm walking it very well at all, but that, that's another thing. But So here we are in this time, and when you have a culture that denies the existence of the divine, I think it's a culture that's going to go mad, and it's also a culture that opens a spiritual void up within itself. And all sorts of monsters will flood into that. All sorts of monsters. Extreme political ideologies, um, pseudo-religions, um, all sorts of things are going to happen. And what you're also going to have is a, uh, a drive towards real religion again, whatever that might be. But you're going to have a period in which things really fall apart. And I think that's where we are. I've written about this at great length, probably too much length. And just going through my book again, for uh, going through my essays for the book, I've been reading again about some of the writers who predicted this 100 years ago. Yeats was writing about this, Spengler, René Guénon, Alistair MacIntyre wrote about it famously um, 50 years or so ago. It's been very clear for a long time to people who are really paying attention that things were going to come apart when we hacked the cross down from the roof of our church. And as I say, you, you don't even have to be a Christian to see that. I think it's plainly true. So we're living in this time in which we have destroyed religion. We have denied that there is any reason for religion. And regardless of whether you like religion or whether you're a Christian or anything else, um, I think you can see now the, the, the pseudo-religion, especially the, the major pseudo-religion that is being built to fill that void. And that's the religion of the machine. And that takes us towards transhumanism. That takes us towards the quest for immortality, the quest for control of the natural world, the quest for denial of the existence of our, our biology, the complete reframing of what we are as human beings. We stopped worshipping the world and we started doing what Chesterton said we would do, which is to, sorry, we stopped worshipping what was beyond the world and we started doing what Chesterton predicted, which is to worship the world and above all the strongest thing in the world and the strongest thing in the world at this point is our ego and our desire to use our technologies to render that ego immortal. And so that's what I can see happening out there. And I think it's something that just has to happen and we're going to go through it. That's the age of the machine. Fundamentally, it's not really about technology. It's about who we think we are. It's about anthropology. It's about spirituality. What is a human being? What is nature? What is our place in the universe? And what are we going to do about it? Those are the questions all religions are designed to answer. Those are the questions that the machine is designed to answer. So I don't really know what to do about this as a writer. This is a very long conversation with you. Um, and what I'm trying to say is, fairly recently I haven't been writing these big long essays of mine. I haven't been writing as much as I'd like to write, and I do thank you for your patience. But when I get back in the saddle here, I'm going to have to have things to say again about this, and I don't want to be repeating myself. But I want to try to dig into what's going on from a, from a Christian perspective, but also from a human perspective too. What does this new faith of the machine mean? Where's it going? What are we doing? How do we live through it? All of these questions. Um, and I don't really know how I'm going to do this. There'll be some essays, maybe there'll be a few videos, maybe I'll just sit here with my little fire iron and a hot toddy and talk about a few things as well, but primarily I'm a writer and writing is what I do, so I'm going to try and write about what the new theology is, what the new theology of the machine looks like, what new gods are we worshipping, that's the question that really interests me, how are the old Christian heresies taking new shape, how did Gnosticism make such a remarkable comeback? How did Alistair Crowley predict the future? There's a writer we haven't talked about very much. Everything he wanted to happen is happening. It's an interesting time to be alive. And I think it's important to try and work out what's going on. To do it without being paranoid or fearful. To keep walking towards the light. But also trying to analyse what's closing in around us. Because I do think this is a very particular time. And it's moving so fast it's very difficult to write about. Now I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, because as I say, I feel like I've been drawn out of the world a bit, 
and I'm hovering on the sidelines now. I'm not the writer I used to be. I don't know what writer I'm going to become. I don't know what's going to happen really. But I'm going to keep going here and uh, in a month or so, maybe a little bit more, I'm going to start doing something along the lines of what I tried to talk to you about here. So really I wanted to say, as well as saying thank you to Yaroslav uh, for, for the gift, I want to say thank you to you, all 50,000 of you, really. Thank you to you for sticking with this. Thank you especially to those who are paying for it. I do appreciate that that's a big deal. And especially to those of you who are founder members who are paying more than you need to pay. Um, it makes a difference. Sometimes when you're a writer, you say more than other times. You have to, sometimes you have to compost. What's going on inside you has to compost so that something else can come out. We don't just produce words on tap. But something's brewing. So thank you for your patience. Um, over the next month or two, our, the Wild Saints and the Holy Wells will keep coming at their own pace um, as regularly as I can. And then when this book is done, I'm going to start thinking more seriously about what I've talked about here. And we'll see what shape that takes. And if you decide to stick around, I really appreciate that. Thank you.